Many of you know I was raised in uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, and uh, we lived on Redan Road, which was a, a busy road even then. Uh, but we had in the back, in our backyard was there was some woods, and there was a a big water ditch that was there that the road, a real busy road, ran right beside, and there were no guardrails to this road. And my mother many, many times told my brother and I, do not walk or play in that ditch. Needless to say, it did not sway us from playing in that ditch. There were a few times in dinner evenings that we would be eating at the dinner table and we, could, we had a, a window that looked out past to the woods and then you could see the ditch there. And, and I can remember quite a few times where cars fell into that ditch. And the very reason my mom told us not to. And my father would tell my mom, won't you call, call the police? And she would call the police and my father would run out to see if he could help them in any way and before they would have to get towed out of this ditch. And I'm talking a ditch, not like a little ditch, like your whole car could fit in it. It was a big one. My brother and I, again, did not uh, sway us from playing in that ditch, but there was one time that did sway us, and it was the last time we played in that ditch. Because a policeman saw us playing in that ditch, turned on the lights, and my brother and I were scared to death. And he looked at us and he said, you know, it's probably not a good idea for you to play in this ditch. Yes, sir. Did your parents know you're out here? No, sir then you probably should go home. Yes, sir. Last time I ever played in that ditch. I also had to change my pants when I got home. <laughs> but I can tell you, on a, humor, a humorous way, but understanding our God has a firm stance when it comes to our sin, that He can't just let it go. It has to be paid for. Yet he was willing to pay for it on our behalf. The cross is a constant reminder of that payment for us. That's why we have it on the back wall here. It's why it's lit up because we want us to remember the cross. Remember what Christ has done. Tonight we're going to be in John chapter 19. We're going to be looking specifically verses 25 to 42. It's entitled, It is Finished, which is what Good Friday is about. The finished work of Christ on the cross. We have a theme this morning and it is this. It is that our sin and debt were completely taken care of. When Jesus paid for it on the cross and worship is the only response that is deserving of it. Jesus' death shows us how deep God's love is. And we're going to pick up our story when Jesus was nailed to that cross. The place of suffering. The very first thing that we're going to see this evening is this, is that it was finished on the cross. Point blank. It was finished on the cross. We're going to see this in verses 25 to 30. So verse 25, pick up with me there. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister. Mary was the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved nearby, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her as his own. What do we see when it is finished on the cross? The first thing we see is at the very end of Jesus' life, he was focused on others. He was not concerned about his own life on that cross. He was concerned about others. He was focused on others. Jesus put others before himself all throughout his life. And here he is, the doorstep of death. And what is his concern of? Others. His dying wish is for his mother to be cared for by his friend. We're talking about it is finished. And what does it stand for? What is it? Well, it is the rule of sin. Adam and Eve 
were the cursed by sin when they chose to break God's law. And the broken order took over in creation. It was man's wrongdoing and desire to not follow God is what broke the order of creation. But here we have people of faith who have received the forgiveness because they've gone to Jesus and said, I am wrong. What I have done was wrong and I am sorry. I need your forgiveness because they themselves could not stop sin. Jesus came to defeat death and sin. Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15 say this, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He gave, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailed it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus came and he conquered death so that you and I might be viewed by God as if we were righteous, knowing full well we are not. Yet when he looks at us, he sees us as righteous. Once again, Jesus showing his concern for others, being focused on that until the very end of his life on earth. Pick up with me in verse 28 of chapter 19 in John 19 in your Bibles. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled jesus said i am thirsty a jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to jesus's lips when he had received the drink jesus said it is finished. Without he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The second thing we see when it comes to the fact that it is finished on the cross is that Jesus shows us the seriousness of sin. You see, we don't think of sin as that big a deal often. In fact, especially the smaller ones, right? When we look at them, we, what really is a small one? I mean, in God's eyes, there is no difference. Sin is sin, and it needs to be righted. It needs to be paid for. Because every sin is falling short of God's desire for us. God wants us to love perfectly. Again, knowing that Jesus shows us the seriousness of sin, He wants us to love perfectly. Loving God with all of our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And when I say love perfectly, it's not something we can do on our own. But with Him, we can. Did, you, did I just say that we can live perfectly? Yeah. In Christ. Because of his payment on the cross, you have the ability to obey and choose. We won't choose every time. We will choose sin. But we have the ability to walk with him because of what he has done in us. Throughout scripture, God has called us for, called his people to repentance. But in order for the relationship to be restored, God provided a means through sacrifice through these sacrifices didn't remove. We are so thankful that God takes our sins so serious 
But if I'm honest, the only way that God deals with my sin makes me very uncomfortable. You see, God being God, couldn't, couldn't, he, just, couldn't he just forgive us? Why did he have to die? I mean, if he can do all things, why? Why go through this? When we look at the cross, we don't want to think that someone would have to die for me. You see, to understand this gravity and God's, to understand God righteously, he had to atone for the sin. Atone is a big word of me making it right, holy. Making it holy. Making it right before the Father. The only way that this could happen is if blood was shed. And it had to be perfect blood. You see, God is holy, and he, has, he is just, and He had to provide a way for us knowing we could not save ourselves. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 says this, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. 1 Peter 2, verses 24 and 25 say, He himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that when we might die to sins and live for righteousness, by his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray. But now... You have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Going back to this seriousness that Jesus shows us about our sin is that without Jesus finishing that payment of sins on the cross, we would not have the ability to have a relationship with the Creator, nor would we be rescued from our sin. Therefore, we would have to die. We would have to be separated. You see, by the wounds of our sin that Christ bore on the cross, our souls have been healed and are no longer forced to go astray when we trust in Him. That picture of that our sin, yes, we are born with what's called a sin nature, and we cannot go along with this sin nature when we choose Jesus. What that means is that sin has a hold of that heart, but as soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that hold is no longer. That's what we celebrate. We celebrate the fact that you and I do not have to be bought, do, do not have to continue in that sin. We have been freed. But before, if we don't choose Jesus as our Savior, you can't not sin. You don't have the ability, nor do I, but Christ. On that cross, what we're talking about this evening, He paid for it. It was finished. The second thing we see tonight is this, is it was finished in death. Verses 31 to 37 in chapter 19, read with me, it says, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when it came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He 
he knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Again, the fact that Jesus' body was not broken at crucifixion is special because it was foretold many years before. As well as they are going to look to the one, meaning they're going to look at him as Savior, the one who was pierced. They didn't pierce the other two. They pierced Jesus, just Jesus. So again, we see this completion come to its reality with that scripture. We see in verse 31 that, that does our appreciation for the cross allow us to avoid the death? First thing we see is Jesus' death makes us uncomfortable, and it should. It should. It's, it's a hard scene for us to grasp. If, if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, it goes to graphic detail of what took place. But John shares and, and spares us a lot of this detail, and I'm thankful. But, but even still, it's really hard to visualize. But wasn't... Wasn't there another way that he could die? Why did it have to be on a cross? God being God, couldn't he just forgive us? Why did he have to die? Why? We look at the cross and we don't want to think that someone would be willing to die for me. So, why did he? Again, to understand the gravity, we have to go back and understand God is holy. God is just. God is perfectly loving. The second thing we see is Jesus' death shows us the depth of God's love. If we go back, if you go back in your Bible and you look at John chapter 3, where the, the most famous passage in, in Scripture that we, that we know of is John 3, 16, right? And so we know this because God created us, and He loved us so much that He was willing to give His only Son to die on our behalf that we might live with Him forever. He sent Jesus into the world not to, to condemn humanity or to judge sinners, but to save us who were lost. This love moves people to respond because it is finished in death. And the third thing we see is this, it is finished even in the burial we see something very amazing. And as we look to this passage, verse 38, it says this, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and the body was, and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. That's right, 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jew Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. What a beautiful picture we see even in the finishing work of even this burial when we see Jesus' death draws faith out of shadows. 
You see, Jesus' death drew Joseph out of the shadows. And what we see here is he was one who was one of those Pharisees that was watching and following Jesus, trying to find things wrong. And as he continued to listen, his heart became softened and he began to believe. And in fact, when it came to Jesus' death, he believed it so much so that he was careful as, as he studied these different things, he saw Jesus for who he truly was, the Son of God. He draws faith out of the shadows. When I was in college, I had a friend of mine that uh, I got to know during my years in college, but it was when I came home to Georgia, I had met this friend named Vinny. Vinny was a friend of mine who was saved during that time, the summer when I was, uh, when I was home. And at that very beginning, I'll never forget his life because it was simply just catapulted. He went from being one of the most rotten people to being one of the best people I've ever met. And I remember just seeing this leap of faith and so a faith. And so I remember being one who has grown up in the church, grown up and never was not ever not at the church when the doors were open. That was me. Right. So God graciously gave me this beautiful life that I'm so thankful that I have been able to to walk in. But when you watch a, a life like Vinny transform, boy, does that spark just jazz you up as a follower of Jesus. I remember sitting there and just, and he had him sleeping over one time and, and we were so excited about what God was doing in his life. We, we, we started writing a devotional together and just, again, just a flip of a switch. He couldn't wait. And he, and I just remember this, this just mindset that he had that he's like, I got to do something for what Jesus has done for me. I'm like, Wow. It's like, like, Vinny, when did it just, when did it just happen? When did it just change for you? He's like, y'all were just talking about it. And God changed my life. Simply conversations of sitting with a bunch of my friends from youth group and sitting there and just talking and inviting this friend to come up and be a part of our life. And his life was changed dramatically because he heard what we were saying about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about the blood that was shed on his behalf. He's like, holy smokes, he did it for me. His eyes were opened. God changed his life. He drew this faith out of the shadows. See, out of nowhere, Joseph and Nicodemus come forward. These guys have been out in the, in the shadows this whole time. Then Jesus dies, and they're like, okay, this is real. All right, we, we want to take this body. We want, to, we want to care for this, because we truly believe that he is who he says he is. They have been in the shadows as these Christians, but seeing Jesus die this way, it drew them out. Why? Because they knew the scriptures. They knew the things that were foretold. And when they looked at Jesus' life and saw all the different ways, they're like, holy cow, his, bro his bones weren't broken. Holy cow, he was, he was speared instead of, of being his, his legs broken. That goes along with what we've studied our whole lives. He truly is the Son of God. Out of di complete disrespect of the Sanhedrin, who their peers, they responded this way. We don't know how many were there when this took place, but they knew that they had to move. They knew they had to walk in faithfulness because it is what they had studied. We didn't know how else they would respond, but we know what took place because when they saw Jesus' life, when they saw it finished, they decided to bury him the way a king should be buried. <clears throat> I believe you can't look at the death of Jesus and not make a decision. When we look, either we are looking to, are going to accept it or we are going to reject it. When we get to the place where we open up God's word and you see the truth of what Jesus has done on your behalf, you have to choose. 
you either have to choose to believe it or you have to make a conscious effort to reject it. I believe that the only response of that, of those who accept it, the only response is worship. And now I'm not talking about getting, grabbing a guitar and getting up here and playing. I'm talking about just celebrating what Jesus has done. The very fact that's why we gather, it's why we sing songs, because we just want to worship our King. We want to worship for what He has done for us. Jesus is calling you to look again at the crucifixion. He's saying, look, I've provided a way for you to no longer die. For you to live in the freedom of no longer being bound to your own sin. How deep is his love? God is calling his church out of the shadows and to walk faithfully with him. So tonight, as we, as we take these things and apply them to our lives, I want us to understand two things. Is first and foremost is, we need to make a decision. It's difficult to, to look at the cross and the death of Jesus and not result in a decision. The truth is, is we are. We are either choosing to follow Jesus or we're not. Making a decision, we want you to make a decision today to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I can promise you, you will not regret it. The second thing is this, is to worship Him for what He's done. What that means is simply when you wake up in the mornings, you're just grateful that you're taking a breath because Jesus died for you. That Jesus died for me. Remembering that our response is appreciation, it's gratitude and thanksgiving for what He has done. Our sin and debt were completely taken care of when Jesus paid for it on the cross. And worship is the only response that is deserving of it 